Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joan Donovan. I'm the research director over at the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, where we study media, politics, and public policy. Uh, one of the aspects of my team is that we've been looking at for the past several years, the relationship between uh, fringe and unpopular groups on social media and how they move politics and how they influence the culture. And so today I'm going to present to you a couple of the strategies that have been used by activists as well as uh, white supremacists uh, using social media, how they get their political objectives into the world, how they get attention, how they uh, find resources and figure out how they're going to uh, carry on their politics. And then we'll talk a bit about what can be done and what has been done historically to shut them down. And then hopefully what we'll end up on is a discussion of how do we make this better? How do we build a public interest internet? How do we think about the role that journalism should play here? What is the role of librarians? What is the the need for activists to focus on um, as we think about justice online, representation in politics, and of course, um, the ways in which technology should really serve us instead of uh, the few people that have figured out how to consolidate technology to work pretty much only in the service of profit and I'm really happy to be here uh, today as um, over the years I've learned a lot from activists in Barcelona about how to use the internet and social media for social good despite all of these problems that I'm about to describe and how those problems have really impacted our capacity to do politics and to make the technology that we think society should have. Instead, uh, those who decide what technology is and does uh, tend to mold it so that it serves uh, first and foremost a security state uh, as well as the profits of uh, very few very large companies. In the US, there's just a few companies uh, in Silicon Valley that take up most of the revenue uh, that goes into the innovation space. And if they do, um, if they do find that there's competition, they buy it up and shut it down. And so we're in a really bad spot uh, in terms of our technological futures if we can't run minor experiments that would question the design of our current social media landscape or question the design of our infrastructure uh, because of the way that it is, uh, it is currently being utilized. Um, and so without further ado, this presentation is called Rough Justice. And it's really about the moment that we're, we're in uh, in the United States post Charlottesville, which is the, uh, there was a very large white supremacist rally where several people died and uh, hundreds others were injured. And it probably never could have come together and happened the way it did if it hadn't been for networked organizing and uh, a, a news media or a press that was ready, willing, and able to amplify the voices of white supremacists. And I'll go through all of that in the presentation. But first, some definitions. Demonetization. So one of the strategies for stopping uh, white supremacists and extremist groups from growing and using online tools has been demonetizing them that is removing privileges or access to built-in features for profiting off of content or social networks. Deplatforming, that is the permanent account removal usually used on mul multiple social media platforms. And we've witnessed over the years the deplatforming of many 
well-meaning, justice-oriented activist, as well as uh, fringe and extremists. And this goes against uh, some of the principles in the United States that are used to govern the internet has caused a lot of problems. The idea that everybody should have a voice online, even if they're using it to organize genocide. Uh, I, of course, do not take that that um, position. I think that if you are using platforms to organize violence against another race or gender um, that that under no circumstances should these companies keep your content circulating. And then lastly, we're dealing with media movements. That is groups that connect, collaborate, and organize by making their own media and networks across various information and communication technologies. I think many of us are familiar with media movements, probably participate in them ourselves. But I promise you that the white supremacist movement has gone global. And one of the ways they've gone global is because they too are fashioned as a media movement. That is, they create their own media, their own podcasts, their own uh, articles and blogs in order to keep groups together. The problem with that, of course, is that the articles and blogs and and podcasts and video content are made to attack and uh, disrupt the political organizing of, in the U.S., mostly people of color or women or any group that they view as a target, including the boogeyman of Antifa or anti-fascist organizing. Prior to that, it used to be the group Anonymous, they would uh, demonize Anonymous. And it was less um, impactful, of course, because not everybody knew who Anonymous was at the time. But they also organize as what we would call anti-media movements. That is to say that they organize against the mainstream press and they try to plant narratives and junk news into the information ecosystem that makes mainstream news outlets uh, like here in the US, uh, uh, CNN or MSNBC or the New York Times trying to make them look ridiculous. So why can they do this? Uh, what is the terrain that they're working in? And uh, for this, I draw on the work of Sasha Kostanzichok, who says social movement media practices tend to be cross-platform participatory and linked to action. And they're all embedded in what's called an algorithmic economy. That is, <clears throat> when we post online, we interact with an algorithm. And then that algorithm decides who the audience for that content is. And so as we shape our content, we're often cognizant of the tags or the uh, the information that we are linking it to, the keywords that we're embedding, the picture that we might be circulating, all with the understanding that we want more people to see our content. And so therefore our content has to be um, interesting to the algorithm, not just to people. That's different from a algorithmic economy, say back in 2011 during Occupy, which recently just had its 10 year anniversary, or you could think about 15M in the same way, where the algorithms were much more straightforward. If you went on your Facebook feed, it was a chronological feed of information. There was no uh, demoting or shadow banning of posts from group pages, and people got organized um, through Facebook and Twitter primarily. But the algorithm wasn't of such consequence unless you wanted to try to make something trend. And I know in Barcelona, people had de developed a uh, technology called CoTweet so that uh, multiple people could operate the same account and tweet from it so as to get around the bottleneck of having to share the password on a single account and also could um, make that account seem much more lively and be uh, to post more often. 
which uh, had the effect of making those accounts using co-tweets seem uh, much more energetic and, and were much more seen as a result of layering technologies on top of the, the system as it's designed. Of course, we see that now and those layerings uh, tend to be actual features of the platform now in terms of being able to time one, set up a bunch of posts and time them uh, or utilize online advertising to reach audiences uh, and be assured that you're gonna reach them rather than trying to come up with uh, a way to engage new publics. And so the algorithmic economy shapes how activists on uh, either the social justice side of the spectrum or on the side of the spectrum that involves uh, white supremacist organizing, uh, both are working in the same information environments. So what does it mean? We went from the media outlet getting interest to their audience, getting content to their audience, and then trying to monetize their audience to um, movements learning from media outlets that you can also move, uh, move messages to uh, the public and increase your reach of your messages. So movements were not trying to monetize so much as they were trying to uh, increase their reach. And over time, this has turned into a model where producers uh, see people as media consumers, so producers of social media, but they also see the consumer as a distributor. And that's really important because traditional media outlets do not see their audiences as distributors they see them as pro potential profit. Movements don't always see the people who spread their messages as distributors. They try to reach those messages, they try to reach other activists with those messages, but they're not necessarily concerned that those people uh, by and large then spread the message. Over time, of course, uh, movement folks have learned that that is part of being in a movement is participating in social media messaging. But by and large, uh, the outlet, the news outlets that can figure out how to make their news consumers also distributors of their contents are the ones that tend to rule the internet these days, including um, in the US context, outlets like Breitbart, outlets like uh, Fox News, and as I'm going to talk about today, live streamers approach this in a different way. So live streamers are people that go to cons, uh, go to events and and uh, stream it live. So whereas something like the New York Times would use websites, social media, email, news, and podcasts, and YouTube to distribute to a bunch of other platforms, we have a different relationship now with uh, um, audiences that are expect to uh, just be the distributor themselves. In movements, we call this rhizomatic communication, which is the simultaneous use of multiple channels for collecting, sorting, and broadcasting information to coordinate action across different platforms. And uh, while these tactics were pioneered by social justice organizations and groups like 15M, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, uh, the unfortunate situation, or even the, manipul the, the municipal movements uh, in Spain, um, these actions or this particular use of the web has been, uh, I hesitate to use democratized, I think it's just spread as a set of tactics where um, fringe groups have figured out that the combination of using all of these tactics moves their ideas into the mainstream. And so you have groups like Unicorn Riot, which began covering events during Occupy, Justice for Trayvon, Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, and is now publishing leaks from far-right message boards and chat rooms. They're approaching this, and this is a proto-anarchist organization, very left-wing, are using a series of 
platforms in order to get their message out there. But you see the exact same thing happening on the right, a group called the Red Elephants, uh, self-described as a media militia, began covering protests and conducting live doxing at protests and infiltration of leftist groups. Vincent James is the founder, but has co-streamed with Baked Alaska uh, and other um, known white supremacists in the US. But they too use a rhizomatic structure to get their their content across, which means that the internet itself is not neutral, but it's crucial. And we have to care what the content and the behavior is of different users, even if they're all using the same technology. And I think that that's really important that we understand is that technology can be used to different ends. Uh, And that's really the conundrum that we're in right now is technology companies will say, well, we just put the technology out there, people use it. Uh, But there was one case study that we should look at closely where technology companies behave differently. And so um, during the Charlottesville uh, Unite the Right rally where a bunch of online groups came together, fringe groups and organized white supremacists and militia groups uh, headed up by Baked Alaska, Richard Spencer, David Duke, these names might not mean much to you, but they are well-known white supremacists in the US. Uh, During this rally, um, there was a large anti-fascist contingent and a car, a Dodge Challenger was driven into the uh, protest of the white supremacist rally. And this here are fake, content collages, evidence collages that were made and circulated on um, far right message boards, blaming this guy, Joel, claiming that he's a leftist, he's a punk, he's a Bernie fan in order to cover up for the fact that it was a uh, person who was part of an organized white supremacist group who used his car to attack this crowd and killed someone. Uh, And this led to tech companies behaving differently. So right prior to this rally, which was uh, August 12th, 2017, we saw Airbnb cancel the reservations of people going to Charlottesville for the rally. We saw Facebook remove the Unite the Right event. We saw altright.com, which was Richard Spencer's website, was DDoSed or Uh, made impossible to use by activists. Then Monday, uh, after the rally, we saw significant changes, a different attitude from companies. GoFundMe removed campaigns to raise funds in support of James Fields. Facebook deleted links to hate-filled articles about Heather Heyer, who died across the site and removed a number of extremist accounts and pages identified by Quartz Magazine to be extremist pages. Discord, which is a chat server for a uh, chat app for gamers, shut down the server for altright.com for messages violating their terms of service. GoDaddy, which is a domain hosting site, dropped the site, The Daily Stormer, which is a far right site, after a hateful article was published about Heather Heyer. And Google froze the Daily Stormer domain. So they couldn't move the domain anywhere and reset up the infrastructure of their movements. Tuesday, it continued. PayPal renewed its commitment to its acceptable use policy, which prohibits payments or donations that support hate and violence. Uh, That was thanks to Color of Change, which was their blood money campaign. DigitalOcean, a cloud hosting platform, responded to criticisms on Twitter for providing services to the Daily Stormer and the crowdfunding site Hatreon, which is a a riff on Patreon uh, by terminating both of their accounts. WordPress dropped the fascist site Vanguard America that was used to organize and tell people how to get to Charlottesville for the Unite the Right rally. Wednesday, it went on. Cloudflare, which is a, a security company, banned the Daily Stormer. Squarespace, which is a payments company, deleted the accounts of the National Policy Institute, which is run by Richard Spencer and other white supremacist sites. You're starting to get the point. All of the companies started to do something 
even though prior to that, they said there was nothing that could be done. And then Spotify removed the music from a list of hate bands identified by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a nonprofit here in the US. Thursday, OkCupid, a dating site, found white supremacist Chris Cantwell on their site and in a Twitter post said they had banned him for life. Following a move to dailystormer.ru, that Daily Stormer site was taken down. Patreon, which was their donation site, was also not accessible uh, online as they tried to move it around the internet so that they could get money for uh, uh, legal defense. And then Richard Spencer later posted, it's time for Washington to regulate Silicon Valley. Law-abiding citizens should have a right to use social networks, payment systems, and hosting, which make up the public square of the 21st century. So my question to you all um, is, is this a public square? Or should we begin to think about technology, especially companies like Twitter and Facebook, as creating products? And if these are not the public square and they are in fact products, how do we approach them as products? And I'll wrap up on this idea that I would love to discuss with you, which is that in some ways, the research that I do on misinformation and hate speech online, I think about the metaphor differently. I think about it as uh, especially misinformation at scale. That is when millions of people are being told lies about the election. I think about it as secondhand smoke. I think that it's really important that we do know the true cost of misinformation. We know who pays the price for uh, white supremacists and other organizations seeking to bring about genocide uh, or a white ethno state um, through genocide. Um, I think that we should, as a country uh, and as as activists think about the public health costs of unchecked misinformation because as you know social media doesn't just allow you a place to post content through the tools that I had been talking about earlier they do um, allow you to monetize content they allow you just like a uh, Uh, any other broadcast, they allow you to reach many millions of people at once. And we see the consequences of that. And through the Unite the Right rally, we see also that companies are willing to take action. But the problem is, is those actions don't stick. And activists have then gone and utilized uh, in the US placing public pressure on advertising companies to say, oh, hey, your ads are being served next to white supremacist content on YouTube, you should pull your ads. Uh, So using a demonetization strategy. But what the company's reaction to that is uh, essentially nothing until you get the press involved. And so is it the case that movements then to bring about a healthier internet should be working closer with librarians as well as journalists to think about, well, what is the appropriate uh, way in which we could build an internet that serves timely, accurate local knowledge uh, in proportion to uh, all of the other funny and interesting and entertaining things we see online so that the internet can serve the people rather than what we have right now, which is that we have uh, pretty much an open circulatory system for information that has been uh, attacked not only by foreign governments, but also by uh, domestic actors that otherwise wouldn't have the audience and the voice that they do to move uh, consumers into spreaders of information and then downstream of that, mobilize them to take action in public, uh, which in many instances in the US has led to extreme violence. I've only shown you one case here. And so I know I'm not painting an incredibly rosy picture, but I do think it's important that we discuss these issues. Thank you.